So we have reached the end of Genesis. It's really exciting. Uh, we met a lot of great heroes along the way. Uh, we started off with Adam, of course, and Eve and their tribulations. Noah and his heroics and the episodes of his life. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, of course, and Joseph. And this week's parsha is called Vayechi. Vayechi means, and he lived. And now the entire Jewish family is in Egypt. They're, of course, led by Jacob, who's already in last week's parsha, 130 years old. He's really um, getting up in age. And he lived in Egypt for 17 years. And he was 147 years old. And the parsha basically is oriented around the end of Jacob's life, and then eventually afterwards, it's it's kind of setting up the stage for the dramatic change that's going to happen to the Jewish people, the family, uh, after that entire generation passes. Now, there's an interesting uh, note here. Uh, between every Torah section, so there's 54 Torah sections, between all of them, one of the next one, there's a little break in the Torah scroll. If you open the Torah scroll, you'll notice that there's uh, just white space between every parsha, and even within a parsha, there's uh, va- various sections that have just uh, end to the end of the line. Now, between every book of the Torah, there's actually fa- four empty lines that separate that. Now, all these things have been since the times of Moses, and every parsha has a break between it and it, the, its preceding parsha. With the exception of this one. Between Vayidash of last week and Vayichi of this week, there's no break. It just keeps on reading. No, no, no stop. And this is really strange. And Rashi tells us that the reason why the Parsha is closed, there's no opening, is because, well, he gives us two reasons. Number one, because Jacob died in the sweet Parsha. And once Jacob died, the hearts and the eyes of the Jewish people closed. Why? Because that really marks the beginning of the enslavement. That's the first reason. The second reason is that Jacob wanted to tell his sons about the redemption, and it was closed from him, and therefore it's marked by the Torah portion being closed as well. That's what Rashi says, two opinions. Now, what's interesting is, is that Jacob died, but the enslavement didn't actually begin for many, many decades afterwards. In fact, we're told that until all of, jo- of Joseph's brothers passed, uh, there was no change in the status of the Jewish people. It means once people of that era, that generation, was still alive, nothing happened in the form of enslaving the Jewish people. Yet, Rashi here tells us that when Jacob died, that's the beginning of the exile. What this means is that the exile was really twofold. There was one exile that started when Jacob died, and the physical enslavement only began when all of Joseph's brothers died. So what was the exile of Jacob? What, what actually happened was something very subtle, and that is a shift in ideology, a shift in perspective. Jacob was a beacon uh, of faith, of Torah for his people, for his descendants. And numbered 70, then the last year's parasha, we find that they start growing very rapidly, very fast. And Jacob was a link that they had all the way back to Abraham. J- Jacob was Israel. He was, he was the one who struggled with the angel. When they had him in their lives, uh, their, uh, their commitment to their values was unhindered. Now they're in Egypt. They've been there for 17 years. Their kids are going uh, involved in Egyptian culture, uh, albeit in a separate community in Goshen, but still the part of a larger community. Uh, they're integrated. Their, their famous uncle was one of the, you know, there's street signs everywhere for their famous uncle. Like that, they're, they're integrated in, into the society. And invariably that affects their attitude. They become acculturated the morals and mores of Egypt start to creep in. And once Jacob dies, he's like he's kind of the fortress. He's the, the, the you know the defense buffer against any contamination, so to speak, of 
the culture and the ideology, once he dies, they're already enslaved. Oh, well, they're not actually enslaved. You know, they're still part of the royalty and they're still part of the aristocracy. They're still Joseph's family. But the way the Torah looks at them, the enslavement has already begun. You know, I think for us, you know, we're Americans, right? And we're proud to be Americans. And we should be. It's been a very good country for the Jewish people to live. But I do think that there is a risk of someone becoming acculturated and, so to speak, being enslaved. Not, of course, physical enslavement, but that's what the Torah is talking about over here. There's this ideological enslavement that we have. And my grandfather used to always say is that in America, they have often Sunday. So you have Saturday and Sunday and off. In Israel, Sunday is a regular work day. So regular work day and Sunday. But in America, you're, you're off on Saturday and you're off on Sunday. So in our heads, we kind of conflate the two. Saturday's an off day. Sunday's an off day. They're both off days. The truth is, is that Saturday's Shabbos. And in, you know, the Jewish communities worldwide, there was always a difference. You know, Shabbos was different than the rest of the days. Shabbos is Kodesh. Kodesh means distinct, separate. Shabbos is always separate. And now we kind of have Shabbos and Sunday. We kind of conflate it. They're both off days. We don't go to work on either one of them. But what happens? We kind of lose the prestige of Shabbos is somewhat diminished. Now, now there's a few other interesting just tidbits here. First of all, the fact that the Jewish people are suffering because they're starting to exile is one thing. The Torah, well, that's an entirely different thing. So, what's what's really remarkable here is that the Torah is almost reflecting the status of the Jewish people. The Jewish people, they're suffering in exile, and Torah is going to reflect that. In fact, we have certain statements in Jewish literature that describe the Torah as being very similar, or a different dimension of the Jewish people themselves. Now also, you know, this idea of having a break after each parsha, I think it's a very powerful one. You know, when you study something, you're impacted, hopefully. You want to try to integrate that into your mind and into your life, into your behavior. You want to take, take a, some time, a few moments to stop, to reflect, to think about it, to ponder about it, to ruminate a little bit. Right? That's a very healthy attitude. Uh, to, to, you know, to let, let things kind of uh, be absorbed. And after every parsha, the Almighty tells Moshe, okay, you finish writing this parsha, take a little break. A little, little break. Let people think about it. Now, what happens in this week's parasha? We have the beginning of the exile. Sometime, perhaps the lesson is, is that with regards to exile, it doesn't necessarily make sense. You can't think about it. You try to, in your head, do calculations. How does this work? How is this fair? How are we going to get out of this? And you know what? It's all closed. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't, you cannot chart a path of why this happened, how we're going to possibly get out of it. And that's why, indeed, sometimes there's just faith. You gotta close, you know, you don't, there's no time to think about it, or thinking about it is not gonna help you understand it, you just have to accept it, and that's just the way, that's just the way it is, because some things, some calculations are beyond what we could concoct. Okay, so Jacob is getting really old, he's 147 years old, and he's about to die, and he calls his son Joseph, and he tells them, if I found favor in your eyes, I want you to swear and do to me truth and kindness. Don't bury me in Egypt. Instead, take me to the land of Canaan, back to Israel, and bury me in the same place where Abraham, Isaac, and, of course, Leah, his wife, are buried. The famous uh, cave. He swears to him, and he bows to the head of the bed. That's the first episode of the Parsha. Now, there's a few interesting things here. First of all, he calls his son Joseph. Remember, the Torah does not going to give, give us any extra words. We know very well that Joseph is Jacob's son. We've been, we spent the past four weeks talking about that relationship. Vayitra livno li Yosef. He called his son Joseph. There's a simpler way to write that. Vayitra li Yosef. He called Joseph. Why, why is it he called his son Joseph? Now, of course, if you would just read that, it's, you know, if you weren't thinking, examining and weighing every word, why is it there, you wouldn't necessarily ask that question. So there's an interesting Rashi here. Uh, the question is, why does it have to say the extra word, Beno, his son? Just say Joseph. 
we know, we know the relationship has been established already very well. And Rashi says, very strange statement. He called to his son Joseph, to he who has the power to affect what Jacob wants. Also, what's, what, what's he adding? Like, uh, Rashi doesn't seem to be contributing much to the narrative. He called his son Joseph, but he says that Joseph has the ability to do it, to affect the change. I think what the verse and what Rashi are doing is addressing a core transformation. We know Jacob made mistakes, or arguably made mistakes, with regards to how he treated his sons. He showed favoritism to Joseph over uh, the rest of them, and we argued maybe that's bad parenting. Right? That's what the discussion we've had previously. He gave him the, the, the sweater, and he tr- treated him better, and that caused uh, there to be conflict and tension amongst the brothers. So now... Has Jacob learned his lesson? It's been 22 years since those, uh, well, 22 years plus 17. It's been almost 40 years since those events. And now he has a need. So which well, which son is he going to call? Says, says the verse, he called his son Joseph. Means the only reason why he called his Joseph was not because Joseph was any different than the rest of his sons. He called his son, and this time it happened to be Joseph. Well, why Joseph and not the rest of them? Because Joseph was the one who had the ability to bring about the change that he wanted because he was the king or the second in command. And I think that's what Rashi's telling us. It means he called his son and it could have been any one of the sons because Jacob changed and he learned his lesson and he no longer was showing favoritism to Joseph and the friend called Joseph, called his son. Well, which one of the sons? It happened to be Joseph this time because Joseph was uniquely positioned to be able to bring about that change. But to me, it was always interesting because like, you read this Rashi, and you kind of, you don't really uh, understand the question and the answer. Rashi's always gonna, he's always coming to answer something. He's not telling you what he's coming to answer, he's just telling you the answer. You may not, you won't understand the answer if you don't know what question he's asking. He's asking, why does it say the extra word to his son? And he's answering because that's really what he wanted to entrust the mission with to his son. Why Joseph? Because Joseph had the unique, was, had the unique uh, ability to do that. Now, he asked him to swear to do kindness and truth. And here we're told that kindness can sometimes be true and sometimes can be not so true or less true. Our behavior and our positive behavior, we're doing kindness, can have ulterior motives. If I do kindness but only because I think I'm going to get uh, on the back end. But still kindness. But it's not as pristine as if I do kindness totally out of the motivation of doing the Almighty's will, helping other people, doing goodness. How is it possible for someone to do kindness without any expectation of getting anything back from it? To do kindness with someone who's dead. Says Jacob to Joseph, I'm asking you a request of how to bear, how to bear me or where to bear me after I'm dead. After I'm dead, I can no longer give you any uh, brownie points for doing kindness with me. And therefore, says Jacob, this is kindness, but it's also truth. What this means is that when, when the Torah evaluates someone's behavior or someone's action, a good good deed, a mitzvah, it's looking at on it really under a microscope. Yes, it's kindness, but it's a truth. And it's going to zero in on someone's action, but also their motivation for that action. What was the real reason why someone did that? Now, we, we have a, we have the Almighty who's giving us direction in life, and unfortunately we also have the Yetzirah, the evil inclination, who masquerades as a master and a deity by also giving us instructions and you know, bossing us around to tell us how to behave. And we are conflicted because we have two masters, really. And the Almighty says, do a mitzvah, and the Yetzirah says, do a sin, and we have a choice. Which master? Who's our God? Is it the capital G or lowercase g? And hopefully we'll follow, we'll follow the Almighty. We'll do the mitzvah. But now we're doing a mitzvah. We selected into doing a mitzvah. Why are we doing the mitzvah? That too is an arena of conflict 
between these two masters. The Yetzirah says, okay, do a mitzvah, but at least do it because I'm telling you to do it, and all of my motivations behind observance of mitzvahs. So thus, in a weird way, when someone could do a mitzvah, but only because the Yetzirah says, this is a mitzvah that I approve of, I give my stamp approval for this kind of mitzvah, because you're doing it for all these other reasons, not because God told you to do it, but because I told you to do it. Well, how is that different than doing a sin? How is that different? You're following the foreign god. I'm not suggesting people to do sins. I'm just saying, logically, you know, if you just establish who are you listening to when you behave, unless a mitzvah is done truthfully, there is, you know, it needs to be, it, it needs to be honed. It needs to be polished as well. And here we're told that there's this remarkable way to do it. Mitzvahs with dead people. What that means is, find ways to do mitzvos that are not going to have any kickback. Uh, you're not going to get any benefit. And my grandfather would always suggest to his students, try to do mitzvahs and not tell them about them. Do it modestly. Do it just, just, just don't tell your wife, don't tell your kids, don't tell your rabbi, don't uh, announce it in class. Just do it. You are doing the will of the Almighty and you're not telling anyone about it. You don't want anything in return. That's the highest level of doing a mitzvah because that is really doing the will of God without the will of the foreign God interfering at all. Jacob does not want to be buried in Egypt. Why does he not want to be buried in Egypt? So Rashi gives us a few reasons because Jacob, of course, is a prophet. He knows in the future there's going to be uh, plagues that are going to befall Egypt. Some of them are going to involve the subterranean uh, geology of the land, and he doesn't want that to affect his dead body, one reason Rashi uh, gives. Uh, additionally, he doesn't want uh, to have, uh, he wants when uh, when humans are resurrected, he wants to be resurrected in Israel. And lastly, interestingly, he doesn't want the Egyptians to deify him. To deify him. Now, um, like Sandy's mentioned, when Jacob arrived to Egypt, first of all, he's a 130-year-old. He's the father of the great hero who saved Egypt, Joseph. He's a remarkable figure. But also, the famine stopped five years early. And even Pharaoh's really impressed with him when they meet. Uh, he became a somewhat of a hero, somewhat of a, a celebrity in in Egypt. And he was worried, I'm going to be buried here. They'll make a shrine over my grave. And before I know it, the Egyptians will deify me. And he didn't want that for obvious reasons. Now, I think this is interesting. This does really give us a window of insight into what the society there was like at the time. And really, how it's been for a long time uh, in non-Jewish societies. If you saw a human, clearly by any objective standard a human, who was remarkable and was off the charts in some way, there was a tendency for them to be deified immediately. In fact, um, the pharaohs themselves, they would deify themselves. Uh, whenever Moshe, in once we get to Exodus, uh, Moshe comes to talk to the pharaohs, he's always speaking to them in the morning when they're in the Nile. Because the pharaoh would tell his people, well, I'm, I'm a god, I don't need to go to the bathroom. And then every morning he would sneak into the Nile to go uh, use the facilities. Uh, and therefore Moshe would go to him and say, oh, I know, I know exactly who you are and what you are and everything about you. Don't worry about it. You know, like he would kind of just show, show him that I know your vulnerabilities. But this is, this is really surprising that there is a certain human desire when you encounter someone that is able to do things that you're not able to do, you automatically, I mean, you cannot possibly fathom how this fits into the normal scale of human capability. You ascribe super, super capability, you know, a, a, a supernatural transcendental capability to that. I spoke recently about, uh, the story of JC as given in the Talmud. I gave that class here a year ago as well, but I spoke in the Torah Center, uh, on Hanukkah about that. And one of the sources about this episode describes J.C. 
or maybe arguably who is the JC character, as a student of one of the rabbis. He was just an average, or maybe he was a great a, a student, but he was a student of one of the rabbis. He wasn't one of the rabbis, he was a student of the rabbis. But he was pariahified, for whatever reason, by the Jews, and he went to the non-Jews. And the non-Jews saw a student of the rabbis, and to them, they never met anyone like that. He was off the charts, so to speak, by their measurement, by their standards, and therefore they had no choice but to deify him. That's the only thing that made sense to them because they cannot see a human who is, they've never met someone like this who is just performing on a higher level than what they're used to, the limitations that they have built in in their own minds. Now the truth is, had they met any of the other students of the rabbis, they wouldn't be impressed by this guy. But they didn't. He was the one that they got and therefore they deified him. That's one of the theories uh, on this issue. Maimonides, you, know, you look at Maimonides' accomplishments, you know, by in every field that he touched, off the charts. I would imagine that if he was a sage of the non-Jews, he too would be deified. You know, he too is performing in ways that are not standard. Like the human limitations should not allow such voluminous contributions in such uh, disparate fields. It shouldn't normally allow it, and therefore people would be stymied and befuddled by such an accomplished individual. Well, obviously he's not playing with the same rules that we are, deify him right away. Uh, but the truth is, is that our nation is a nation that produces giants. And giants that some people, they encounter them, and they don't imagine how it's possible for people to do that. And that's just the, you know, but we never deify humans because we know, you know, we have a, a certain expanded, you know, standards, even Moshe. Moshe splitting sea and plagues and going up 40 days not eating, not drinking, never once that anyone considered deifying him. In fact, they would always highlight his humanity. Uh, we'll see Moshe's emotion a little bit. But either way, uh, Jacob was concerned and it was a very real concern that he would be deified, and thus he requests him to be buried in Egypt. Now, not only that, he also asks Joseph to swear. This is strange. Joseph is Jacob's son. Joseph, you know, they've been living together again for 17 years. You would assume he's displayed his, his piety until the last, you know, for, for the entirety of the time, for the duration. Why does Jacob find the need to make Joseph swear that he's going to bury him in Israel? So um, I think there's really two potential answers. Number one, we can never be sure. Joseph was in Egypt. He lived there under very trying conditions with tremendous headwinds in his face, you know, obstacles in maintaining his piety and his righteousness. Yes, someone may indeed appear to be righteous, but unless there's an actual clash between the two options, it's still possible for them to kind of create harmony between being a Jew and an Egyptian. Jacob is now asking Joseph, I want you to commit to one or the other. I'm your father. I'm, you know, I'm your, yeah, I'm the, I'm your forbearer. You could choose to bury me in Egypt to build an Egyptian legacy, or you could build a Jewish legacy. Only one of them is possible. Till now, well, you were the Jewish Egyptian. You had the family. You were in Egypt. You had everything. Now is the time we have to choose which, you know, what are your true stripes, and I want you to commit in a way that you can't change anymore. You're, you're, you're bound in an unbreakable bond towards one or the other. And therefore, what Jacob was really asking him that. He asked him, say, I want, which one are you, Jewish or Egyptian? You could, so assuming you could only have one, which one are you going to select? Joseph tells him, I'm going to bury you in Egypt. He swears to him. And immediately, Jacob bows to the head of his bed, i.e., he thanks God. Now, why would God be at the top of his bed? Rashi tells us is that God is always present at the bedside of a of a, a sick, ill person. Now, why would an ill person have God always at their bedside? 
seems strange. Just because someone's ill, what they do, what what do they do to become ill? I want to suggest perhaps that what causes us to be distant from God. The thing that causes a human to be distant from God is where the human cuts God out of the equation. When we're distant from God, it's not God being distant from us, it's us being distant from God. We say, we don't need you, we're pushing God away. We say, we have this, you know, I got this, don't worry about it, I got it. We're telling God, I don't need you. If we are vulnerable, if we're weak, and we realize our own lacking, by definition, we're re-accepting God, and thus God is close to us. For someone to admit their own fallacies, their own shortcomings, and thus subject and submit themselves to God, by definition, they're allowing God into back into their sphere. Thus, someone is sick, and they realize that they're in God's hands. There's nothing, nothing you can do. I'm, I'm, I'm at God's mercy. Someone like that is actually close to God. Moreover, we find Jewish sources that indicate that children, small children, have a special protection. Because no one knows their own limitations uh, more than a child. A child knows. You can't go to sleep on themselves. You know, they have to listen to their parents' orders, even if it means insane, insane things like going to school. Like it's, <laughs> it's, you know, they're, they're totally subject to other people. You know, they, they know that if the parents don't feed them, they have no, like they know they're on their own, so to speak, uh, and they don't, or on their own, they cannot possibly survive. Okay, well, they have that. They're vulnerable. You're vulnerable. God watches over you even closer. Uh, we have a tendency in our society to to look at people who are, uh, you know, m- macho and uh, I got this and don't worry about it. But the truth is that in a certain way, um, it, it discounts God and thus causes distance from God. Now, Joseph swears. We said one reason why he swore or why he needed to swear. Uh, there's another reason, and we'll get to that in a little bit. Okay, so um, J- Joseph swears, and now he, his condition, Jacob's condition, worsens, and he brings over his sons, Menashe and Ephraim, to get a blessing from Jacob. And Jacob, he raises the stature of the two sons of Joseph. And in fact, uh, each one of Joseph's sons, even though they're grandsons of Jacob, they are elevated to the status of Reuven and Shimon. And thus, Ephraim and Manasseh become uh, peers to, uh, to the tribes. Indeed, they become tribes of their own. And... Jacob also invokes some of the problems that may be, some of the issues that maybe Joseph has with him. For example, when Rachel, Joseph's mother, died, uh, J- uh, Jacob made a decision to not carry her all the way to the final resting spot uh, of the forefathers, instead buried her in Bethlehem along the way. And he explains to him why he did that. And then he says, okay, these sons of Ephraim and Manasseh, I want to give them a blessing. He hugs the kids. He tells Joseph, I, I didn't imagine I would see you. No, I get to see you and your children as well. Unbelievable. And Jacob asks Joseph, who are these kids? I think simply you would imagine that Jacob's getting old. Maybe his mind's not operating as, you know, peak performance. He's a little suffering from dementia. He's a little, that's what you would imagine. Now, the Torah is not telling us about the dementia of, of Jacob, clearly. Immediately, two verses earlier, he says, the sons, Menashe and Ephraim, and he names them, and they're like Reuben and Shimon. So obviously he knows who these people are. Like, cause in the same conversation, he already said, these are, from, maybe he has short, short to memory loss. I don't know, but maybe he should have asked that before they met. Don't you think? They meet, he says, oh, these are Ephraim and Menashe, they're like Reuben and Shimon. He obviously knows who they are, doesn't need to be reintroduced to them. And then a few verses later, let me give him a blessing. But who are they? So look at Rashi. Rashi says something very similar. He asks, who are these? He's not asking about the individuals in front of him. Jacob is peering in to the future progeny of Ephraim and Manasseh. And he finds that in several hundred years, Yeruvam, who is going to be the team that's going to cause the, uh, the, uh, split and the schism between the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah, 
this is 500 years in the future, is going to be a descendant of Ephraim. And Yehu, another sinner, is going to come from Manasseh. And what he's asking is not about who Ephraim and Manasseh are, but who are these people in Ephraim and Manasseh's future that are going to be sinners. And which is remarkable, I think, for a few reasons. First of all, Jacob's able to sense that. You know, he's able to perceive uh, who the descendants are of the people he's meeting, which is really remarkable. We'll see Moshe is going to do that as well. When Moshe, uh, when he kills the Egyptian, the first episode that we find about Moshe, well, one in the first narrative about Moshe as an adult, he sees an Egyptian hitting a Jew and he kills him. But first he turns right and turns left. He turns this way, he turns that way, and sees that there is no one, there is no man. Simply, you would say, he turns this way, turns that way, and sees that there's no one watching. I can kill the guy. Rashi tells us that he, that he looks into this person's future and sees that no one in the future of this person will convert to Judaism. And therefore, he has no redeeming qualities, and therefore I could kill him if needed. That's what Rashi says, which is the, it's kind of the same thing. Able to look at someone now and to be able to tell what all their descendants are going to be like, which is really remarkable. Of course, that's an attribute of a prophet, something we cannot possibly have. So that's, so that's, uh, that's interesting that Jacob is able to sense that, but also what this means is that someone's future is really a development, an expansion of their present. You know, and I meet people today who tell me that, oh, 200 years ago or 150 years ago, my grandfather was a rabbi and he wrote a lot of Torah books. Oh, my grandfather was a shochet. He was a bit tzaddik. He was really righteous. But what this actually means is, is how come this person ended up in a Torah class? How did they merit that out of all the Jews in their block and their neighboring community, they're the one who's studying Torah? Well, the answer may lie in the fact that their grandfather years back put an extra prayer for their descendants and now they're just following what the president, what the, what the past had already foretold on the future. And of course, we cannot do that. We're not Jacob. But Jacob was able to look at their prime minister and see the great things about them and see, of course, the problematic things as well. Now, uh, Joseph very famously puts Menashe, who is the older, on his left side, i.e. the right side of Jacob. So Jacob should put his right hand, the more dominant hand, on his head, and Ephraim on the left side, and Jacob decides to swap his hands, and he puts his right hand on Ephraim, and his left hand on Menashe. And Joseph is bothered by this, he says to him, wait a minute, don't, Menashe is the older one. He says, don't worry, I know exactly who's the older one, but the younger one is going to be greater because the descendant of Ephraim is the great Joshua, Moshe's primary student and the leader of the people after Moshe died. Whereas the, the prime descendant of Menashe, Gidon, was also a great Jewish leader, but not quite like, like Joshua. So Jacob's able to see the future, both in the great leaders and also in the villains that are going to result from these people, and thus he's judging them accordingly. So, Jacob gives a blessing to Ephraim and Manasseh. He tells him, moreover, that the blessing that all future Jews will give their sons is to be like Ephraim and Manasseh. And once again, he places Ephraim before Manasseh. Until this very day, uh, there is the prayer that we say, Yesimcha Lekim Ephraim and Manasseh, for our sons, that may the Almighty make you like Ephraim and Manasseh, because Jacob is creating a mold uh, by which Jews will bless their, their sons to be like Ephraim. There's something special about Ephraim and Manasseh that is remarkable, and that's what a parent should aspire, that their children should aspire to be like Ephraim and Manasseh. I once heard a suggestion, why Ephraim and Manasseh? Why not the Reuben and Shimon, or... Judah and Joseph, or Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. There's a lot of people that it could be. Jacob is telling us that we should try to tell our children, aim to be like Ephraim and Manasseh specifically. I once heard a suggestion that Ephraim and Manasseh, they were the next generation, you know, Jacob's grandsons. Yet, the degradation, so to speak, of the generations didn't affect them. Reuven was a son of Jacob. His grandson, his children were the grandsons of Jacob, and they were not at the level of being tribes, because they were the next generation. They were twice removed from Jacob. Ephraim and Manasseh, they too were twice removed from Jacob, yet they managed to not lose stature 
and thus to be considered as if they were sons of Jacob. And what this, I think, the overall lesson is that we look at the generations from Sinai as getting progressively worse. The further we are away from Sinai, the further we are uh, from Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the further we are from these experiences, the more spiritualistically diminished we are. And thus, we're telling our children, try to reverse the trend, so to speak. Even though your children, so to speak, you're one generation later, always aspire to be like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and going back and reversing the trend that is the default. The default is that as we progress, we regress, uh, and try to undo that and try to aspire, at least to aspire to be like Prime Manasseh, who were able to butt that trend. Now, J- uh, Jacob is about to die, and he's given a blessing now to Joseph and to Joseph's sons, and he calls in all his children, and he wants to give them all a blessing as well. These are the famous, th- these are the famous death bed blessings of, of Jacob. Now, what's surprising is that if you look at the end of chapter 49, Jacob dies, of course, but the Torah recaps, the Torah recaps the blessings in verse 28, uh, and it labels them, these were the blessings that Jacob blessed his sons, and he gave each one of them the appropriate blessing. And the problem is, is that when we actually read the blessings, a lot of them don't look like blessings at all. Uh, so let's take Reuven here. He starts with Reuven the oldest. Reuven, you are my firstborn, my strength, and my initial vigor. Foremost in rank and foremost in power. However, warlike impetuosity, you cannot be foremost before you mounted your father's bed. Then you desecrated him who ascended my couch. So what this means in plain English is like this. Ruvain was the firstborn. As firstborn, he should have been the spiritual leader, he should have been the political leader, and he should have gotten, gotten a double portion that goes to the firstborn. Those were his by right. However, he lost them. And in fact, he lost all three. He lost the right of the firstborn to Joseph. And Joseph... You know, how many tribes did Joseph end up with? All the, all the other, all of his brothers ended up with one tribe. He ended up with two. He got a double portion. He lost, he lost the kingdom, the political leadership to Judah, and he lost the spiritual religious leadership to Levi. And that's his blessing. Aren't you happy you got a blessing? (laughs) Wasn't it wonderful? (laughs) What would you have done without it? And the question is obviously, what's the blessing? And furthermore, the reason why he lost the, ble- the the blessing, Jacob tells him, is because he had water-like impetuosity. Uh, water is, unless water is, you know, is at the lowest point and it's contained, it's always going to be moving. Water will always follow gravity. And Jacob's telling Reuben, you're, you're like water, you're always moving. You're always moving, and therefore you lost all these benefits that you should have had. And the problem is, is that the Torah considers this an amazing blessing that he could have possibly done without. And my grandfather would always stop. Whenever he would study this section with his students, he would teach his students about a, a really a, a global idea that's very vital for us in life. And that is that we have certain inborn, innate character traits that are very inflexible. They are who we are. That's kind of our DNA, who, how we are comprised. Now, what we do with that is that's our decision. Sometimes we have qualities that can be used for good or for bad, and that's our choice. But there are certain fixed character traits that are not really that changeable. We could direct them in different ways, but they are who we are. You know, if you have a timid child uh, who loves to read, it's very hard to turn him into the rah-rah kid who wants to jump and dance on tables. And conversely, you have a kid who's very, uh, very, um, rumbunctious, and to turn them into uh, a, a book uh, worm is also, it's not possible, unless you ruin the child. We don't believe in taking children and changing them. In fact, we just like to highlight their unique qualities that God gave them and, and create the, who they can be at their best. 
And if you knew, if you had a catalog of what your qualities are, what you need, your unique qualities are, what areas do you excel at the most, and where areas, what are the areas that are your greatest challenges, that would be a tremendous boon because once you know that, you have a map and a roadmap of your spiritual life and you could chart it out in a way that you, A, accentuate your qualities, but also you avoid the areas where you're going to struggle in. What Jacob did for Reuven was indeed a great blessing. He revealed to him his chief problem that he's going to face in his spiritual ascendancy. And that he had a certain quality of not thinking before he acted. And that was manifest, of course, in the story where he swapped the beds. He was disappointed. He was upset. He was, he was riled up. And without thinking of the big, grander consequences, he immediately took action. Now, sometimes we like to encourage action. But action of... uh a king has to be weighed out. You have to think about the possibilities. You have to look at the permutations of the event. There's many factors that a king has to take into account before they pull the trigger on whatever decision they make because the, the decisions have, have lots of implications and impacts. What Jacob's actually doing for him, he's saying, yeah, you lost the kingdom, but you're not suited to be the king. You have a certain quality a certain happy trigger finger that makes you uniquely unsuited for being king. And therefore, it's an, indeed a blessing. It's a blessing for someone who's not qualified to be the king or the president, go with, with that however you want to, uh, to be in a job that they're unsuited for. Yes, to be the king is great, but if you're not suited for that job, it's harmful for you and harmful for your constituents. It's harmful for everyone involved. The lesson is a very powerful lesson here. <laughs> Reuven, not only did he get an accounting of where his greatest challenges are, but also Jacob sets him up in a way that his life or that his, that his career choices are not going to always run in the face of his, uh, of his unique hampering quality that he has. Thus, to not be keen indeed is a blessing. Indeed, to not be a Kohen, to not be the priest is also a blessing for him. Uh, if a priest in a temple, for example, a lot of details that go into running the temple in a proper way without things going awry. If the priest is not thinking and just acting, well, you know what's going to happen? They're going to have to restart it. Oh, this guy messed up again. They got to start from square one. And thus, to not be the priest is also indeed uh, a blessing as well. Now, what happens to Shimon and Levi? Shimon and Levi are the next ones. What does he tell them? Shimon and Levi are comrades, they're brothers. Their weaponry is a stolen craft. Shimon and Levi, they're the ones who conspired to kill Joseph, ultimately acceded to just throwing him in a pit and selling him as a slave. But they're also the ones who, when their sister Dina was kidnapped, they decided uh, to maliciously uh, tell Shem. Uh, and his people, and the city of Shechem, to just circumcise so we'll, we'll let you marry, and then once they were ailing, they just rampaged the way through the city. In both of those stories, the motivating factor was one of brotherhood. Thus, Shimon and Levi are called brothers, and in fact, every time the Torah describes the brothers of, J- of Joseph, one brother said to another brother, it's always referring to Shimon and Levi, because they were the ones who manifest a certain quality of brotherhood. But, they're Weaponry is stolen. They don't, they actually are utilizing Esau's weaponry, not Jacob's weaponry. When I, when Jacob approached Isaac, Isaac told him, the voice is the voice of Jacob, but the hands are the hands of Esau. Of course, that's that individual episode, but also that is the qualities of these two nations. The way we operate is with the voice, and the way Esau operates is with the hands. He operates on a more physical plane. Jacob tells Shimon and Levi, you guys are A, motivated by brotherhood, and you're disturbed if something, if someone starts up with your sister, or that's an attack against all of us, and we have to respond with the most harsh measures, number one. But number two, the measures that you use are ones that you stole from Esau. And then he seemingly berates them in the congregation, do not join my honor, 
in their in 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 their rage they murdered people at their whim they ham- hamstrung an ox. Accursed is their rage, for it is intense, and their wrath, for it is harsh. I will separate them within Jacob, and I will disperse them in Israel. So first of all, he again is telling them what their unique qualities are. Their unique qualities are brotherhood, brotherhood with a little dash of violence. Number one, which is a good thing to know, because this is the way they always were. They were they were teenagers, young teenagers when they went through uh, the city of Shechem, mowed them down. Number one. Number two, Jacob is also setting them up for a life of success where this uh, this drawback will not wear up. What does he say? I'm going to um, separate them in Jacob and disperse them in Israel. Now we know, like we mentioned earlier, the tribe of Levi did not have its own track of land in Israel. They indeed had various cities, but it wasn't all united. So they were scattered around, around the land. The tribe of Shimon were told they were traveling teachers. They would go teach from town to town. So they too never had uh, the opportunity to settle down and to allow feelings of national and nationalistic pride to ferment to the degree that will cause them to behave in a way that's inappropriate. Indeed, again, we see that Shimon and Levi are given a blessing, even though it may sound like a curse. First of all, he doesn't curse anything but their rage, which is important. Jacob is able to separate Shimon and Levi from their anger. He says, accursed is their anger, accursed is their rage. He didn't curse them, he cursed their emotions, number one. But also, now they're set up for a life of success. They're set up in a way that their unique malfunction, or not malfunction, but their unique character flaws are not going to constantly be something they need to fight. You know, we, uh, as a nation, we laud the people that are able to overcome their character. But the way we do that is not by constantly trying to come in conflict with our character, rather to avoid it as much as possible and to minimize the opportunities that we need to overcome. We have a certain fixed quantity of greatness, maybe, or, or, or raw power to overcome overwhelming obstacles. And thus, it's very prudent for someone to try to avoid their unique obstacles that would stand in the face of their greatness. J- uh, Jacob, indeed, is blessing Shimon and Levi by setting them up for success. Now, Judah is given a fantastic blessing. Judah is worried that Jacob is going to recount the episode of Tamar, and indeed, uh, Judah is all positive. And indeed, he's told that he's going to be the king. Moreover, he's going to be the um, the family of the Mashiach, the family of David, are all going to descend from, from Judah. Why? Judah, Judah, the quality that he demonstrated, indeed, the name Yehuda means to admit, to admit guilt specifically. And we know when... Tamar said to Judah, well, who, you know, the person who owns this staff and the person who owns this signet ring, he's the one who's the real father of this child. And Judah mans up and says, it was me. And that indeed says, Jacob, that's the mark of a king. A king is someone who doesn't get himself too much in a hole that they cannot ferret out of. The problem, if someone makes a mistake, that's okay, provided they're willing to admit that it was a mistake and rectify their ways. If the implications are the entire world or the entire kingdom, and they make a mistake, and they're not willing to admit that they made a mistake, they're just going to reinforce and get worse and worse uh, down a certain path uh, towards doom. Judah was one who admitted his mistake, rectified his ways. Indeed, it it, it really demands uh, uh, you know a certain fortitude to be able to do that. He did it, thus he indeed is suited to be king. Now Zvulun and Yisachar. <laughs> are presented out of order. Yisachar was older than Zevulun. So, we know that Yisachar and Zevulun are partners. Yisachar was the great Torah scholar. Zevulun, he's the businessman. He's engaged in commerce. Zevulun should settle by the seashores. He's always doing business. Whereas Yisachar, he's the donkey, so to speak. He absorbs all the Torah on his back. Now, why would Yisachar be... Uh, put in uh, secondary status. Well, why does he come after 
his younger brother, and the commentaries all point out over here, is that don't imagine Zevulon, the one who's the financial support behind the Torah, don't discount how great that is. And indeed, the, Jacob gives the blessing to Zevulon before Yisachar, because if we did not have the flower, so to speak, of Zevulon, we wouldn't have the Torah of Yisachar. And therefore, it's important for Zevulon to, to recognize the greatness and the impact that they have that in a weird way even supersedes the actual Torah scholar himself because the Torah scholar himself can only uh, become great if they have the financial backing. Moreover, the sources indicate that the Torah of, Zav- of Yisachar is actually a cruise towards Zavulan. And if someone is supporting the Torah scholar, and the Torah scholar studies, that Torah is actually a portion of it is given over to the supporter. Now, what <laughs> happens after uh, we reach Olam Abba? Olam Abba, you can't learn any more Torah, yet the sources indicate that Zavulan, who doesn't study, or doesn't study as much, he knows the Torah that Yisachar studied. How does that work? The way that actually works is that we know a child in utero studies all of Torah. All of us have all of Torah within us because our soul has the Torah innately baked into it. It's part of its fabric. Life over here is about earning it, about unearthing it. Well, how do you unearth your Torah? Well, there's the Yisachar Avenue and there's the Zvulun Avenue. The Yisachar Avenue is to study it, to kind of extract it from within. The Zavulan method, well, that's to extract it as well via a different method, but the result is the same. You get to Olam Abba, and both of them know Torah. And it's remarkable because the, both of them managed to unearth the Torah that was latent within them in their unique ways. Says the Torah, Zavulan indeed should come appropriately before Yisachar to uh, <laughs> laud and highlight his contributions. I want to look at the blessing of Joseph. Joseph is given a very lengthy blessing. There's one part of it specifically that I have a very specific fondness to, and that's the very first verse. A charming son is Joseph, a charming son into the eye. Each of the daughters climbed heights to gaze. And the last word there is alay shur, which Rashi gives us a whole bunch of different reasons, a whole bunch of definitions of what this even means. Now, uh, one of the definitions is, is that the, when Joseph was being paraded throughout the city of, uh, uh, th- throughout Egypt, when he was appointed as viceroy, all the girls climbed on top of the roofs to get a glimpse at this new hero who's gonna save, uh, to, who's gonna save Egypt. That's what Rashi tells us. And the girls are climbing on top of the roof. Now, my grandfather wrote a famous book called Alay Shur, which means on top of the roof. On top, on top of the wall. And what he says in his introduction is that there's this thick wall <laughs> that separates the Torah world from everything that's outside of the Torah world. And even people that are studying or studying a little bit, there's something there that not everyone is partaking of. And in his book, he writes, what we're going to do is we're going to go Aleishur on top of the wall that's separating these two worlds, and we're going to be like those girls who are going to be peeking to get a, get a sense of what this world is and the wondrous things that are happening in there. And maybe if we get a glimpse of what it's like, we'll actually climb down and try to find those the doors, the gateways into that world and to partake in that ourselves. Which to me is really interesting, especially uh, if someone knows uh, my grandfather's own personal story. It somewhat mirrors that of Joseph. Uh, where Joseph was alone on an island, he's in Egypt, there's no one around. Uh, my grandfather, indeed, in when he, during the war, when he was in Sweden, uh, there was no other Torah scholars around, and he, indeed, stayed true to his beliefs like Joseph did, and thus he felt a certain affinity for, for Joseph, and that's why he named his book uh, after this episode. Pretty remarkable, but that's why I wanted to share that sort of personal feeling uh, towards that. I want to quickly go to the end of the Parsha here. Uh, Jacob dies and Joseph asks Pharaoh permission to bury Jacob in Canaan. And he asks him in chapter 50, verse 4, if you please, if I have found favor in your eyes, 
Uh, my father made me swear I'm going to die uh, and go bring me to the land of Canaan. Uh, now let me go bury him. And Pharaoh responds, go up and bury your father as he made you swear. Which is implied in it is that had Jacob not made Joseph swear, if he wasn't bound by the unbreakable bond to bury Jacob in, in Canaan, in Israel, then he would not be, Pharaoh would not have allowed him to do that. So once again, we see Jacob's foresight. When Jacob says, I want you to swear, maybe Jacob was also uh, aware that there may be a problem along the way where, uh, where Pharaoh would not allow it to happen. Now there's a very fantastic Talmud here. Very surprising as well. Rashi brings it down. When Joseph became viceroy of Egypt, he had an interview with Pharaoh. And part of the qualifications to be king of Egypt was to be able to be well-versed to converse in all languages known to men. That was the requirement. And Pharaoh was testing Joseph, and they would start talking in Swahili and French and Spanish and in uh, all the languages, Latin, all the languages of the time, whatever they were. And Joseph was responding in each one. Joseph, he had the goods. And then Joseph's like, well, what about Hebrew? What about Lashon HaKosh? And he starts speaking to him in Hebrew. And Pharaoh's dumbfounded. He never heard that language. That was the language that was only part of the Jewish people and their tradition. So Joseph essentially had damning evidence that would disqualify Pharaoh from being king, because there was one language they didn't know. And there's no way he could have known unless someone taught him. But Joseph says, you know what, I'm going to swear to not reveal it. Now, many years later, Joseph swears again to Jacob that he'll bury him in Israel. Pharaoh tells him, bury him in Israel like you swore to him. So Rashi says that Pharaoh is essentially telling Joseph, if you transgress this oath that you made to your father, you may come to transgress the other oath that you made to me and disqualify me from being king. And therefore, I don't want you to do that. Don't Go follow your oath. But he says, I'm only letting you go because you swore. Only only because you swore. If you hadn't sworn, I wouldn't have let you go. So this is really really surprising because had, you know, jo- uh, Joseph is not going to say, oh, uh, you made me transgress one oath, I'll transgress the other oath. The real reason here is like this. What Pharaoh was fearful of is that Joseph will become accustomed, subliminally, so to speak, to transgressing oaths. He's forced, he's handcuffed to transgress the oaths he gave to Jacob, but that will somewhat diminish the importance of keeping your oath in his perspective, and that will eventually lead to the other oath as well, not necessarily right away, immediately, and, you know, in, as a reprisal, but because, well, you know, he got, he got used to, he got calloused from the importance of oath, and that may indeed affect Pharaoh as well. Go bury him in Egypt, as you have sworn. Jacob is buried in Egypt. There's a dramatic story that we'll have to wait till next week, I guess, to tell over about what happened when he was buried there. Uh, all the brothers die, and the Parsha ends, and the book ends with Joseph setting out a vision for how the Jewish people are going to get out of Egypt sometime in the future. I look forward to studying. On to Exodus.